languages. Uh, and the question that uh, is moving me in this talk is to, to look at uh, the, the, the relationship between syntax and prosody and trying to, to predict whether a special syntactic phenomenon is going to be related to its prosodic properties. So this is really not completely uh, clear what I mean. So in, uh, so is it the case that some intonation types or some prosodic types are more prone to allow a specific syntactic phenomenon? And in this case, discontinuous nominal phrases than others. So the, the thing is, uh, languages differ a great deal uh, among each other. Uh, according to their prosodic and intonational phenomena. And does it mean that these intonational and prosodic phenomena or properties uh, act also on the occurrence of a certain uh, syntactic construction? And then, if it is the case, can we predict which languages will have this uh, relation, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this continuous dominant phrases? and which do not. Yeah? And then, which kind of relationship is it? So all these questions. OK, so um, discontinuous nominal phrases can be, uh, can, can be shown to obey different syntactic patterns and different prosodic patterns. So uh, I will show from a syntactic perspective there, there, there are two kinds of uh, discontinuous nominal phrases. From now on, I'm not going to say discontinuous nominal phrases anymore. I'm going to use the term split. Okay? And split means discontinuous nominal phrases. Because discontinuous nominal phrases are just too long. <laughs> uh, so we have two different syntactic types of them, but we also have two different prosodic types of them. So the, the, the two different uh, syntactic types are what can be called hierarchy preserving and hierarchy inverting types. I'll show you in, uh, in a minute what it means. And the two prosodic types are cohesive and non-cohesive. And the question that I want to investigate here is, are these two divisions, so hierarchy preserving, hierarchy inverting for the syntax, and cohesive, non-cohesive for the prosody, also found in, uh, in Indian languages? So the investigation uh, relies on a survey of about 200 languages for their syntactic and prosodic properties. It's, it's, it's a big amount. So this is a collaboration with Gisbert Franzelo uh, in Potsdam, Germany. And we have been working on this project since uh, 15 years. So <laughs> some of the older persons here can testify that, that uh, we have uh, we are, we are busy with this uh, project since a long, long time. Not doing only that, but uh, yeah, a large part of the time. So uh, as far as atrocity is uh, involved, uh, we don't have 200 languages, because the problem is the languages are really difficult to get, so to say. Um, and the analysis of intonation is slight, so there, there, there are no, not so many languages which are analyze for their intonation uh, because I don't know why. So maybe intonation is a difficult subject or maybe it's not interesting or something or maybe it's too early in the, the history of linguistics. But the fact is uh, syntactic properties are much be better understood than uh, prosodic uh, aspects of language. <coughs> okay, so my talk is going to be structured uh, in this way. First, I'm showing the syntactic division into yeah, the inverting and the preserving type. And then the prosodic uh, distribution, the, the division between the two types, cohesive and non-cohesive. Then uh, I say something about the role of information structure uh, for the building of these split constructions. And then I show you some Indian uh, language data and a uh, very short OK, first, the two syntactic types, hierarchy preserving, hierarchy uh, inverting. So, and first, the hierarchy inverting split construction. Um, yeah, so 
I can illustrate that for only for languages where it's evident that they have them, and also I'm going to talk about Indian languages later on. So here, German. So if you, uh, a language like Maria had called Damar's Fila in this state too, meaning uh, Mary has probably then many Indian cities visited. Uh, you have the nominal phrase in the middle, the object, and uh, you can construct Städter hat Maria damals wohl viele gesehen, or cities has married then probably many and then Indian maybe visited. Okay. So this is hierarchy inverting in the sense that you, you take the head of the, of the DP and uh, you put it at the front of the sentence and you invert the word order but also the syntactic hierarchy that, uh, that is uh, created in this uh, modern phrase. Um, hierarchy preserving splits are much less frequent universally. Uh, in German, we have only one. Uh, was, was hast du für Bücher gelesen? Meaning, what have you for books read? Something like, what kind of books? Which is actually uh, construction of uh, an Indian. Uh, so, in the hierarchy preserving split, uh, you have. Uh, uh, something else than the head noun, which is wu, so to say. But the, the basic thing that we can focus on uh, for, the, for the moment is you preserve the word order. Okay. Um, Slavic languages are actually better than German to show the difference because Slavic uh, languages have also uh, hierarchy preserving on a regular basis. Okay. So they have both. They have hierarchy inverting, uh, and like in this uh, uh, example of Ukrainian, where you have books, Mary has read interesting. So books and interesting have been separated, yeah. and books is uh, has been fronted. <clears throat> and uh, they also have hierarchy preserving, which is called left branch extraction uh, very often where you have uh, actually the highest head of the specifier of the DP, which is uh, attached at the edge, uh, at the left edge of the clause. So we have, for instance, like here, in which he we go time. Okay. So, and in Ukra Ukrainian, but also Russian, uh, Polish, uh, Czech, and uh, you know, lots of Slavic languages, these constructors are completely Okay, so it's, they do that all the time, so to say. And uh, the hierarchy inverting type as well. The hierarchy inverting type, uh, so this is called split topicalization very often. So it's a topic focused construction where usually where you have to remove one element to the multiple and you make you make out of this element the topic. So the book in this case would be the topic. And the, the, the the remnant, if you want to like that here, the, the adjective in this case, is usually the focus. This is not necessary. I will show you that when I, I turn to information structure, that uh, the focus, topic focus uh, division is uh, absolutely not necessary. <coughs> okay, there are um, syntactic theories, so you can be quick uh, about them. Uh, one of them is um, this continuity as extraction. So this is something that you would expect, right? You have a, 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 a continuous nominal phrase, and you take one element out of it to extract, you extract it, and you put it somewhere else. So uh, Van Rimsey, for instance, uh, he was one of the first who described this construction uh, in a syntactic uh, framework. And he, he wanted to have this, this approach. The problem is, well, there are a lot of actually problems with the extraction appro approach. First, you have all kind of mismatches when you have two parts of the phrases. You can have a mismatch in terms of uh, number, for instance. So in, in the example one, the topicalized element is a plural, but what do you keep? in situ is a singular. Yeah. So here you have uh, Indian cities, okay? Knows Mary only one. So yeah, this is something that you can do in a lot of languages, not all of them. 
product of, 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 of that, but uh, yeah, it's not so strange. And then there is also this construction uh, which can be called uh, double noun splits. So, so all these constructions have, have very different names. Okay, so I choose one here, double noun splits. Uh, for instance, uh, in German, birds, nose, marry, most of all, ducks and chickens. Okay, you have two times the, 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 the objects here. So the thing is, so this is also something which, uh, which uh, I mentioned. These two parts of, of a split construction share a, a theta role. Okay, so they, they, they have the same role, uh, uh, which is uh, given in these two parts. Uh, and then, uh, in some cases, you have preposition doubling, like here, in Schlesson, have been a number of time in the world. In castles, have Peter yet in no, in no one, or not big lived, okay? Um, so this is also something, if you have an extraction in this, you wouldn't, you wouldn't expect that to repeat something. Okay? And you have also this preposition doubling in a number of languages. And then, Maybe the most important point is that the extraction obeys different constraints than the split construction. So, for instance, here uh, you usually cannot extract in out of a dative construction. All kind of oblique case are blocking extraction, but uh, you can you can do split construction uh, with this construction without any problem. So. Even if I went faster, other than the, the, the result is the extraction theory has a lot of problems. Even though it's the let's say the, the most intuitive one, and you would expect to that, that that you do that, this is actually not the best one. Another one is the base generation. Evidently, yeah, you, you generate the two parts of the um, split construction individually. Uh, so this. This is probably better, in, at least in some cases, it's probably better. Uh, so, but you wonder why, why do you generate two, two non phrases yeah, in uh, two different positions then? Because it's not what you expect from the semantic and also from the general syntax point of view. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm sparing you the, the detail of what people assume in base generation, assume exactly. Uh, this is a bit technical uh, and uh, I think it's not necessary if you, if you are interested in you know. So, uh, last thing for, uh, you know, last one thing actually for the syntax, the demarcation. So, what is, what are these bit constructions? What are, are they not? Okay? So they are not extraction uh, of a PP out of, it, of an MP. So for instance, uh, who has James painted a portrait? James has painted a portrait of Rebecca. Uh, of Rebecca. So of Rebecca, of whom, I'm oh, sorry. Of whom has James painted the portrait? Of whom is a prepositional phrase, uh, it's an argument, so to say, of the portrait. Okay. Uh, this is not a split construction. Yeah, this is something else. You you move a whole uh, major phrase, so to say, out of the, of the phrase. <coughs> uh, it's also not quantified floating. Yeah, something like the boys in an old dance. So of course you have also all the boys didn't dance. Yeah, that's impossible. But still, this all in the case of quantified floating has different properties in, in many languages. It can be kind of adverb for something like that. Uh, then in some languages, the adjectives are relative clauses. Uh, so of course, in this case, if it is a relative clause like in Word of, uh, then uh, it's not a strict construction. Mm -hmm. uh, secondary predication is also something to consider, and it's also not a strict construction. So let's say the man left drunk, okay? Of course, it's more or less similar to the drunk man, man left, but you, I guess, you are a linguist and you feel the difference. So I don't have to explain it. Yeah? He left and he, and he was drunk when he left. Or something like that. Uh, and then three topics, like in French, les livres, on va dire, on a lu beaucoup. So the on is uh, kind of doubling of uh, les livres, okay? 
This is also not a uh, split construction. OK, so the split construction is really a two part of, of one DP. Yeah, so it should be. Um, so the last point on syntax <laughs> is that the, the emergence of split construction correlates with um, other things. Um, so most languages which have split construction allow also uh, a DP without a head. Okay, let's say uh, I, uh, books uh, I have read interesting. So this is in, 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 in English it's not possible, but in many languages it is. So if you have interesting as itself, like like in German, many in Indian languages uh, as well, then you expect to have a split construction more easy. And also scrambling. So scrambling uh, is probably one property which uh, correlates with split construction, but not necessary. Not, just not necessarily. Okay. Um, well, even if here it actually it might be necessary, but probably not. Uh, but it's certainly not sufficient. If you have, if you have uh, scrambling, it doesn't mean that the language necessarily also has split construction. <coughs> okay. And then, yeah. Just one clarification. Yes. The preposition scrambling constructions we are not considering split. <laughs> yeah. Uh, preposition scrambling constructions we are not. Uh, no. no, I didn't mean the off form, but where the off is left. Yeah, 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 yeah. So no, 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 that's not. That's Any W H No, no. This is not a normal trace anyway. If you have yeah, it's a preposition. Yeah. No, no, this is not something that's uh, that we're looking at. Thank you. Okay, so uh, from the syntax. Um, the two syntactic patterns, so it's inverting and preserving, are not equivalent. Well, so, um, yeah. so probably, if we, if we, if you look at the two main syntactic theories that uh, we have, uh, that I, that I have uh, mentioned, um, so if you have an uh, hierarchy inverting type of split, it is probably better to have. To have base generation in this case, maybe. But if you have the, 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 the hierarchy preserving types, maybe you have movement. Yeah. So uh, at least the two parts of the of the um, of the normal phrase are just separated by something, one word, two words, uh, one constituent. But they are not completely uh, separated from each other. And the prosodic structure to which I now turn is very helpful to make to understand better the difference between these two kinds of uh, split constructions <coughs> and also the relationship that they have with each other. So now uh, let's take a look at uh, the, 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 the two types of prosodic of, of prosodic construction, the cohesive and non-cohesive prosodic pattern. <coughs> And first, uh, the non-cohesive pattern. Um, so in, I'm very grateful to Paul Pandey because he introduced this morning all the, 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 the concepts that I need for uh, introducing the prosody, uh, an article phrase, intonation phrase, and so on. Uh, so I'm not going to, to introduce them in detail anymore. Yeah. Um, but OK, so I'm using them. <clears throat> so in the non-cohesive pattern, uh, you have the creation of an additional prosodic phrase. Okay, so or an in intonation phrase depending a little bit at what level you are. In many cases, it's different to know whether you are at the level of the prosodic phrase or at the higher level of the intonation phrase. Anyway. But uh, so if you have a non-cohesive pattern where the two elements of the normal phrase are really separated completely. Then you have two canonical phrases, and each, and they, they both are well formed, meaning that in the language, in the Germanic language, each of them have a pitch accent because of continuity. No, uh, each has a boundary tone, 
And then you have the relationship between the tones in the prosodic phrase, which tells you a little bit how uh, the relationship is between them. Uh, the prosodic domains on these two no, uh, parts of the nominal phrases do not need to be adjacent. And also you can have more than just two. Uh, we illustrate that immediately. So in German, for instance, you can have uh, two split constructions in one sentence. Okay. So here, you, uh, so Fehler konnte Maria sich richtig dummes bisher keiner leisten. So this is a uh, sorry. This illustrates that you have you can have three times three different parts of uh, split construction. So mistakes would be the first. Could marry herself really silly, second point, so far not allowed. So you have three parts of the, of the um, split construction. Yeah. But what I, I actually wanted to show you is that you can have two split constructions in one sentence. And this is the parallel Sonaten haben Kinder bisher nur wenige welche komponiert. And then you have sonatas and welcher, so some sonatas. And children, children, and a few, a few children, and most of them are scattered in the sentence. But still, the sentence is really easy to understand. Okay. So this is uh, <coughs> this is absolutely no problem. So you have lots of prosody phrases. That's what I wanted to show you. With, uh, so more than two prosody phrases may be involved. Okay. And uh, this, the non-cohesive pattern is preferred in inverting space. So if you look at the prosodic structure here, you have Sonaten and Kinder, both inverting patterns. This and Ovenia, from the phrase, mention of the word, from the phrase. So each, each of the parts of this Two different split constructions are in uh, different positive phases. Uh, now to the non-cohesive pattern. Uh, <coughs> so in the in, uh, in the non oh sorry yeah I'm still uh, in the non-cohesive pattern. In the non-cohesive pattern, there may be a down step between the two uh, high tones. So if you say something like that, Lenda has Maria Vega you see. So yeah. Lenda at Maria Vigneur, you see. Vigneur, you see. You see the end here. So you have one, two, three <laughs> high tone, and they are in down, down step relationship, meaning that every high tone is lower than the one preceding. This is a very strong acoustic uh, uh, cue to tell us where the, the two tones are in a tight relationship to each other meaning the words, uh, the text, build one big uh, um, yeah, domain, so to say. Uh, but this is not necessary. You can also have something like that. Italian future has been the high part. So she bought three Italian book, also with a uh, inverting pattern. Then you can read the first, the high, the quantifier here. Okay. And then you have here, you have no downstep. And this is also. This is also okay. So downstep is also not necessary. <coughs> okay, in a cohesive pattern, um, well, you have only one of these domains. It can be a prosodic phrase or a dimension phrase. So you have only one pitch action which is really needed, uh, and only one boundary tone. Um, and often the, 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 pitch, the pitch accent that you have, so the the, the pitch accent is on the fronted part of the discontinuous uh, uh, piece or the construction. And both parts, as like I said, are minimally separated. And the cohesive pattern is strongly preferred in preserving splits. So here, uh, the, the, the Ukrainian sentence uh, that, uh, that we saw before. Um, so I can try this song. It's going, please close your ear. No. Mm -hmm. I tried that in some and it doesn't work. I don't know why. So I'm trying to do that. Thank you. 
blocking sounds here. Uh, maybe if, if you are really interested, in, so I don't, I guess you are not so interested in the equation, but if you are interested in, in, in one of the Indian synthesis techniques, uh, I can get out of the, the presentation and uh, try the sounds. Uh, but okay, here, um, yeah, this is the, the canonical world order in Ukrainian. And you can see uh, and downstep all over. But you look at the the, um, the hierarchy preserving splits now, yeah, where you have how many and shares separated by some constituents, but the, the world order is kept. You see that actually the big the big events in the intonation is happening on the how many, and after that you have distressing compression and so on. And this is very typical. This is the normal case, so to say. And in the canonical world order, you don't have that. You have you have uh, the the how many and then Sarah and then Maria and the verb. Okay, so they are all. So they are, they are all prominent uh, of the story. Okay. Um, yeah. So in German, you have the same thing. Uh, no, in German, sorry. Uh, you, the thing is, you can have a cohesive pattern on an inverted split, uh, like here. So you can you can have Bücher mit Maria Fidelzi. So you have the big falling accent on the first word and the rest is the accent. This is possible. But then of course you have a focus on books and the rest is given. Yeah. So in the context of many of what did Mary read? Like <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah. So summary for the prosody. Uh, the second prosody pattern, the cohesive one, is much more restricted than the inverted one because it's hard to get, so to say. Uh, you have one prosody phrase and the, 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 the whole sentence uh, is usually just in one domain. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Yeah. So, information structure, well, um, I'm going to, to get uh, quickly over that uh, as well. Uh, so the thing with the intonation information structure is that because of this strong topic focus with preference in the uh, in inverting split, people have said, yeah, it is it is actually the normal case. It is when you have a topic focus, then you have to to, to make uh, your split construction. But this cannot be really true because you can have all kinds of information structure on this construction. Yeah, it's easy to construct sentences where you have a focus and a given thing, or two fo foci, uh, or a topic and another topic. Yeah, that this is all is possible. Yeah. Uh, but what is true is something else about the information structure. And it's the case that it looks as if if you have a nominal phrase and two parts, two different parts of this nominal phrase uh, need different information structure roles, then it's difficult to realize. Because you know in a language like uh, German uh, or English, you have an adjective and a noun, and you put as I want to show you, you, you put your accent on the noun, okay? And the adjective can have an, uh, an accent or not, but you don't care because you don't, you don't even listen to that. But if the accent on the adjective is important, yeah, and the, other, the, the accent on the, on the noun is also important, then you have to separate them. Yeah? And this is the case if you want to, to have a topic interpretation on the noun and a, and a, and a, a focus interpretation on the adjective. And then you end up with an inverting split. Yeah, and this is this is happened if the syntax of the language allows them. Yeah. Of course, there are lots of languages which do not allow them. Okay, so it's that. Uh,
So now to the Indian languages. Okay. Uh, what we saw um, until now, we saw different languages. I don't think too many. But the languages uh, I showed you were all intonation languages, as far as the intonation system is concerned. Uh, that means that in, uh, you always had flexible pitch accents and flexible phrasing. So you can change that yeah, in the intonation languages. Germanic, Slavic, most Roman languages are, are like that. Yeah. Uh, but you have a lot of other prosodic systems. You have, for instance, the pitch accent languages like Japanese and Swedish and Basque and other languages where you have some specified tonal uh, uh, tones on some syllables, uh, and the rest is intonation. So to say. And then you have tone languages like the African and the uh, uh, um, yeah, East of the Asian and uh, Mesoamerican languages, where nearly all syllables are specified for tones. Yeah? And you have phrase languages, or languages where the intonation happens on the prosodic phrase. So and this is very interesting because many Indian languages are like that. Yeah? So uh, you, you have this predefined low high uh, on, on a phrase, yeah? and you cannot change much. Yeah? We, we, you have variation in it. Definitely, you, you can put two phrases in one, as Paul showed this morning. You can have more flat realization, sometimes even falling. But basically, you keep this uh, low high uh, uh, thing. Meaning that the melody arises mainly at the phrase level and not through the action of pitch accents like in the Germanic languages. Okay, so yeah. So in our survey we have uh, 14 Indian languages, up to now. Uh, Indo Aryan languages, uh, Assamese, Bang Bangla, Kohamshati, uh, Hindi, Maiti, Malati, Korea. Dravidian, Canada, Malayana, Tamil, Telugu, and Tibeto Burman, Indonesian, a little bit, Meitei uh, and Changla. Uh, um, they differ in the kind of speech they allow. So we have several which have only high inverting, like in Oya, and also the three um, uh, Dravidian languages, Malayana, Tamil, Telugu, which are very restrictive also. And uh, we have also a lot of languages where we have both types of uh, scripts, hard inverting and hard preserving. So all Indo Aryan except for Oriya. Uh, and no language has only in, uh, preserving script. But this is general. We don't find any language which has only hard preserving. This is a, an interesting thing. If you have hard preserving, in the language, then this language also has a uh, party university. <clears throat> so, um, so in this last part, we will see that because of the different international system that Indian languages display, we also do not find the cohesive, non cohesive division, strong division that I showed you for Slavic languages and also uh, Germanic languages. So, Indian languages are not intonation languages, and none of, none, of it, uh, none of them are, which is interesting because, you know, if you look at the, the, the history of prosodic research, it's all based on languages with pitch accents. Yeah. But Indian languages do not have these pitch accents, or not conventional pitch accents. So, uh, evidently, they need some different kind of analysis. <coughs> Uh, so when I said that you have initially a low tone and a final hold, uh, high tone, this has been described by many people actually. So these are just a few for Bangla, for Tamil, Assamese, and Hindi. Uh, yeah. So it has also been described for several Indian languages that the phrasal intonation overrides the lexical stress of words. So even if you have lexical stress, mm -hmm. like in Bagla, for instance, uh, you usually you don't hear it because it's just overwritten by the phrasal intonation. Yeah, you have your low tone at the beginning, and the low tone may fall on the stress syllable, but it doesn't really need to. It can be also a little bit yeah. in, in 
the neighborhood, so to say. And this is confusing for people who are, in, uh, you know, who have looked at intonation and expect to have a strong correlation between a, a stress and a pitch accent. Mm -hmm. uh, so this has been described especially for Assamese, Hindi, Bangla, and Tamil, which has actually quite a lot of languages. If you know that the, the good prosodic uh, uh, studies of Indian languages are really rare up to now. So showing exactly the same, <laughs> the same uh, picture that the uh, shows uh, this morning <laughs> for Assamese, yeah. So I have here what he says about that, yeah. So, um, so he says we have a limited role of prosodic words at the post lexical level. Uh, only when a prosodic word constitutes a prosodic phrase independently, like the one here on Ramen. Uh, it makes its post lexical appearance. This implies that prosodic words do not obligatorily mark their presence at the post lexical prosodic level. It is rather prosodic phrases which provide the building blocks of information and control. Okay, so this is his explanation why you find this nice L star, which he analyzes as a pitch accent and a high tone which he analyzes as a boundary tone, but you don't find it on uh, this word. Is it exactly the same? It's in, no, it's a bit different. Yeah, so here, but the, the, the fact is exactly the same. Here you have two words in one body phrase. And then, and then even if you have here a lexical stress, you, it's not there, it's not really present. And the, the verb, the final verb is just <coughs> So, um, but Kim for Tamil says not nearly the same. So she says a bit the, well, she says that the building block, the basic building block of Tamil intonation is also writing contour, which typically uh, occurs on each lexical words except the last. Uh, and she says there are no lexical distinctions. Distinctions dependent dependent on stress in Tamil and native speakers. Even those with phonetic framing do not have strong impressions about the red of uh, For Hindi, even if there is a lexical stress, as our uh, uh, shows, uh, it seems to be difficult for people to to really agree on the on the song in some cases. And this is. <coughs> the result of the joint paper with Yoshikoski, uh, Paul, and others in America. <coughs> uh, okay, so we'll do that. <coughs> and for Hindi, uh, in a joint paper with the uh, former paper, former Monday paper, uh, we also found that the building blocks of information in the language are processing phrases. So we have. Uh, we, we, we found that not only the intonation is really useful for deciding on the, the prosodic phrases, but also some other yeah, properties. For instance, a motion stop for vowel emission now, and uh, we also higher uh, a higher pitch uh, preceding the focus word, meaning that the, 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 the separation. When you when you start a focus word, you stop. Well, you, you indicate that now a, a focus word is coming by increasing the height of the preceding body phrase. <coughs> uh, so skip all that and come to the fit construction. So Hindi allows both hierarchy inverting and hierarchy preserving these continuous, continuous nominal phrases. Uh, hierarchy preserving ones are allowed in more contexts than hierarchy inverting ones. So this is interesting because we don't expect that because I showed you that uh, hierarchy uh, inver uh, inverting are allowed actually in more languages than hierarchy preserving. But still, Hindi seems well. This is to be very fast. So all the data for Indian languages are a little bit pre preliminary, so we need more data. 
Okay, so I skip from here and I draw the number. Yes. बंद कर दिया मैं। क्या हुआ? क्या हुआ? मैं भी बंद कर दिया। 